Welcome to the On Your Mind podcast, where we are changing the mental health narrative, bringing hope and solutions. Here's your host, Timothy J. Hayes, psychologist. Dale Ryder is a social worker who currently provides services at the New Beginnings Center, serving those people with chronic pain, addiction, mental health challenges, and trauma. Her specialties include family program and workshops, spirituality, equine program, and experiential workshops. She also provides Reiki sessions that include journey work, assisting in a holistic approach to trauma release. She is passionate about the work she does and living in a supportive environment that feeds her spiritual, emotional, and personal needs. The recovery field has given her an incredible opportunity to assist others and gain insight into her own personal growth while assisting families in generational healing. She works to assist others in reclaiming their authentic self through connecting with spiritual practices and accepting the vision of this path to wholeness. She is currently in the process of publishing her spiritual journey as a memoir titled Surviving Irene. This will contain or have a companion journal to support the work of others on a bigger scale. Well, Dale, thank you for joining me here today. Oh, you're so welcome. It's my pleasure. I'm hoping you can get us started by telling us a little bit about how you got into the work you do and what drives your passion for it. Absolutely. Um, You know, even in high school, people would call me their counselor. (laughs) So I think I was kind of born into it um, just as a natural empath and wanting to help people. I've always had that desire. Um, And in what I call my first life, I was a probation officer. Um, I worked with juveniles and then to the adult system and really found that that work was um, not where my passion was. Um, it was helping people, of course, but when I had to, you know, go into homes and do searches and um, that sort of thing, it it just I knew it wasn't for me any longer. So, my bachelor's degree is in criminal justice, and my master's is in social work. So. While I was um, working full time as a probation officer, I got my degree in um, social work and kind of created the first in-house therapy um, sessions for probationers. And it just started to kind of go from there and stepped away from probation and worked in some therapeutic boarding schools for a bit. And then many addiction treatment centers followed Um, and then out into private practice and now currently working with a lot of trauma, trauma patients. So I think it's always been in my blood. (laughs) So how long have you been uh, focusing on trauma patients? Well, I mean, even in, in probation, right, the trauma, as we know, has always been there. And so really from the get go, I would say, so I've been at this 30 plus years Um, So trauma has always been woven in there. Um, Addiction treatment is where it, and the therapeutic boarding schools, so much trauma. So I think it's always been a piece to the puzzle, but the center I work for now is specifically around trauma, but yeah, always worked with it. And so how long has it been a specific focus for you? Um. Well, in the addiction treatment centers, we started that. So for the last 15 years. So what would you say is the most prominent thing you've learned about trauma and impacts on the individual? Well, you know, all the work that we're seeing, you know, come out, Peter Levine, and um, we use CRM at our center, which is Comprehensive Resource Model with Lisa Schwartz. Um, you know, I think they're all seeing that it's kind of always been on board underneath um, and that the body, you know, holds the score. Um, I'm also do energy work with people. Um, so I've really seen that. Um, for me, because I'm, I'm, I'm a family 
specialist, if you will. I created family workshops for the addiction treatment centers. And what I saw there, what I believe is our attachment wounds are kind of smaller traumas in a sense that really grab on. And I think they're a little more subtle than maybe what we would call those big T traumas. So I do focus a little more on these sort of underlying attachment wounds that may be a little more subtle for people. Um, so that's kind of been my more of my focus as of late. Um, still deal with the big T traumas too, of course. But So when you mentioned that you do family work and developed a model for working with the families, can you tell us more about that? Absolutely. Um, it started in the addiction treatment centers um, and it really focuses on, so it was bringing, we'd have the client that we had in there, you know, in treatment and patients and we'd fly the families in and kind of take the family apart and put it back together in a couple days um, and did that through boundary work Um there was family sculpting involved, which, you know, um, it's, I don't know how much it's used these days, but I think it was such a beautiful, it was the most powerful work I feel like I've really ever done um, in that sculpting. You know, the client actually creates a sculpt with actual people. Um, Just arranging it, their family members in the room in different positions and, and then um, unraveling the stories that come out from that. Yes. And, you know, the messages that were received and, um, you know, and it, it really opened the door for, for healing of those, those, those wounded parts, you know, parts work is another big piece. And I think in those family workshops, we, so, you know, when we kind of, what I call you know, if we're in our upright fingerprints of who we are, that's when we're in all those beautiful qualities that we were born with. And then we maladapt sideways um, from those kind of smaller attachment wounds. So I always work with people. It's like, we don't want to cut that off of you. We want to see how to get it upright. Um, so we would work with that in the family um, and through that sculpting, that when they tipped sideways, it was really just a mal maladaptation to some of what was happening in the home or their own personal, you know, maybe traumas from school, bullying, you know, wherever. There were so many places that, you know, those kind of attachment pieces start. So as you identify them and you have these different things like the family sculpture and, and things like that that would allow you to identify the patterns, then what do you do to try and start correcting or healing? Yeah, and that's, you know, we'll get into that when we sort of look at those charts, but um, it really is about when we come from that, mal it's such a strong word, maladaptive place, um, we begin to get our needs met from that space. And from the wounded self, the wounded part, those needs are insatiable. Like if we need, if we didn't get love or we didn't get validation, those needs, like people will be trying to get those met for the rest of their lives from that insatiable place. So when I work with more of the upright, like what are, what are the ways to get those needs met, not from the reactive place, but from the upright space, from when you are in your adult self, we would call it in the parts work versus the wounded child. So that it's more proactive needs work rather than reactive needs work is how I talk about it. Excellent. And now you mentioned th these two charts that we have to be able to show. Do you want to step into that already? Uh, we absolutely can. Okay. Um, and before we kind of go there, I'll just... Um, I'll just tell you what I developed from this family workshop, you know, because the the those creating of that that picture, if you will, with the family sculpt, um, I call those snapshots. So when those snapshots, um, when an, an event happens in our world, those snapshots start to pop out and they start to get in the way of actually me connecting with 
Timothy in front of me, I start to kind of navigate life through these snapshots rather than through actual, you know, being with the person in front of me. So, Oh, I know what you're going to say. Cause you did that the last three times this happened. I know what you're about to do. Cause you get upset every time somebody brings up bicycles or yeah. Right. And the body gets hijacked in those moments. So um, that's how I kind of talk about it with people before we go into that is those snapshots start to run the ship. So, you know, we can see it really clearly like a Vietnam or a vet, vet coming back from war and they're walking through a mall and a gunshot goes off in an arcade game and that beautiful individual goes down to the ground. Well, we do that in these smaller ways that you're talking about, right? Like when somebody's not loving us the right way or whatever but then those snapshots start to run us and we're no longer an embodied adult self so just to start with that but we can go into the the worksheet can i right. kind of talk right. about that pull up the worksheet here that you can step us through this so is, this is this is kind right. of what we were just starting to talk about <clears throat> So whatever that event might be, you know, if you're at work and you get some criticism from your boss, your spouse, your partner says something that doesn't quite, you know, fit. Um, a friend maybe isn't as available for you. Whatever that event might be, we go into what I call those reactive thoughts. Now, this is how we work as a, as a being, right? We have thoughts, we have feelings. But when we're operating from that sort of reactive place of these snapshots and those that can be physical body sensation too, the thoughts tend to be irrational. The feelings follow with irrational feelings. And all of a sudden we are kind of in that, that space of hot reaction. Reaction is that built-in mechanism that we have fight, flight, or freeze. We're supposed to have it, it's there for a reason, but we tend to go to fight, flight, or freeze in almost all, every event of our day sometimes. When we're in that space of fight, flight, or freeze, it's really meant for times of life or death. And we kind of go there quite frequently. When we're in that, cortisol and adrenaline are just pulsating through our system, it's taxing our adrenals, um, it can cause, you know, depression, anxieties, all of those things. So we don't, we want to try to move out of reaction in our life so much. We are, we're thinkers and feelers, but we're quite often in that space of reactivity. Um, and from that reactive place, that's where we're trying to get our needs met. And those needs are, as I said earlier, they're insatiable. Um, so it's not the best way to go about, you know, getting the needs met in our life. It can be pretty harmful, actually. Um, and I think, too, you know, the, the piece of it's, there's no rationality when we're in reaction. So, you know, we can be looking at people that we love and they're in that space and they're, you know, having a really strong reaction and reactions can be isolation, yelling, um, addictions, self-harm. Well, and, and as you said, it, it might look like we're looking at the person, but we're really looking at and reacting to the snapshot. You bet, yeah. You bet, yeah. And if we try to even talk with the person at that point, because that, you know, they're in that state of cortisol and adrenaline flooding, they can't really have a rational conversation about it because they're disembodied, dysregulated at that point. So a lot of therapies, you know, talk therapy doesn't really kind of go into that part, right? They, they talk about what the react, you know, most people come in because of this reactivity. So they'll talk about that, but it's really getting the person to be able to get back in their body and not be hijacked by these, you know, these, uh, hormones that are that are taking over um, 
And that's not always easy to decipher because it could be very quiet, right? The person, it may not be this outward, you know, the fighter is more loud. I, I have several people <laughs> in my caseload where when they get triggered, they just seem so serene. Right, right. And they are so calm in their talking. And right. unless they get pushed to an even stronger internal reaction, if you were watching, if you saw a video of this, you'd say, that's one of the most calm people I've ever seen. Right. And if you don't know how to read the whole, these subtle energies you're talking about, you think, well, this person's just calmly, logically responding. They're kind of doing okay, right? <laughs> and nothing could be further. Yes, right. Nothing could be further from the truth. On the inside, they're they're a right. mess. Absolutely. So that cortisol and adrenaline is still pumping, even though they may, because some people tend to actually to go numb, right? Like they go into that the freeze mode, which, you know, I mean, we don't have to get into that, but it's, you know, there's the sympathetic nervous system and the parasympathetic and, you know, but those people that tend to, and I'm, I'm kind of more of a calmer reactor, if you will. So internally, you know, I may look just fine on the outside because I've used to, you know, I'm kind of the protector in the family. So I've been used to carrying that load so I can get really calm and quiet. So, but internally it's the cortisol and adrenaline are still pumping. Well, and a lot of people that I deal with who go into that high efficiency mode, it seems they seem very calm and they handle crisis beautifully and you want them on your team in a crisis and boy, do they pay for it an hour or two or a day or two later when the crisis is passed, they just start having all kinds of symptoms inflammation in the body, right. weakness, loss of appetite, etc. Maybe stomach issue, right? Just all sorts of those body that, you know, the body keeps the score, Bethel van der Kolk, you know. Um, but that's such a beautiful example, right, Timothy, of when, they're, when we're maladaptive. Because I can take care of a lot of things. Because my message is Dale's got to do it on her own. So my maladaptation, now, you know, that may look like, oh, she's strong, she can take care of things, she can handle, which I did for many years in many of these addiction treatment centers I worked for, but my body was taking a beating. I started, I had gallbladder issues, I had to have surgeries, and so when that had tipped, I felt like I had to do it all. Well, that's, not, you know, so that's that, what I mean by now, when I'm in my upright, I can handle things and I can help like you and assist. But when I'm feeling like I have to ha ha handle it all, that's and, when I... And or hide the reactions inside and emotions and... You bet, yeah. You bet, yeah. So, you know, I mean, we can work like with people and people that are listening like that doesn't mean you don't want to have to kind of look at the reactions and maybe do some intervention at that point. But for me, we really have to kind of, because like I said, I do more proactive work than reactive work. And it, it is a little more difficult to do that, but we have to sort of back up this chart to, because the events aren't going to change. We're social beings. We're here on this planet to experience you know, being here. So we're going to have these events going on always. Um, so right underneath that, we do have the needs. That to me is where the sort of intervention really needs to take place. Um, and it's, you know, like I said, it's a little harder to do that. Like we can say, oh, well, I'm anxious and I need to do something to fix the anxiety or um, I'm feeling depressed. What can I do to get out of the depression? which I understand that for sure, but we wanna be able to kind of be this more proactive part of ourselves so that we can be in that beautiful fingerprint. Um, not always, but to the best of our ability. So how do you address those needs? Is that the other chart? Yes, we can pop over there if you. So, um, 
Now, these are, you know, there's the biopsychosocial spiritual approach. And this is just me. I simplified this into three areas because um, it just seems easier. Um, and just real quick, if it's okay, before, you know, um, there, there are these studies, you know, Maslow's hierarchy of needs was around a long time ago, talking about our needs. Um, what I kind of changed about that or, or um, adapted to that is that I believe, um, and the study about the rhesus monkey, I always kind of share it because it really does speak to that. You know, they took a little monkey and I don't like animal studies, but um, they put the little uh, monkey, the rhesus monkey, it has like 94% similar DNA that we have. And they put it in a cage and it had the basics. It had the basic physical needs. It had food and shelter. Um, and then they compared it to these other little monkeys that had each other. They had touch, they had downtime, they had playtime. They had um, purpose and, you know, jobs to do, and they had connection. And to me, what, well, and the, the phrase they coined from that study is failure to thrive, right? Even though the little monkey had the basics, it still was not thriving. Not healthy at all, exactly. Right. Withering and then they Right, right. And then they added in the little mesh figure and kind of put some fur on it. And in the textbooks, it's just a terrible picture. You know, this little tiny monkey is just clinging to this mesh figure. So, you know, it started to get some of those emotional needs met, but it still didn't quite have what these other little monkeys had. So when I work with people, it's like, we and we tend to as you know in our society we tend to focus in on whatever need is like screaming at us versus giving them all attention on a pretty pretty regular basis so if the physical is not well then we go there if the emotional is flaring we tend to go there and our personal needs which we can talk about they tend to get kind of left by the wayside and so the so chart we're I, looking at, because we've got people that will just be listening, sure. the top line reads physical needs, including food, clothing, shelter, and touch. The next category is emotional needs, including love, respect, validation. And the last category is personal needs, including spiritual life, nature, and art. So go ahead. And so, so they all kind of need to have pretty regular attention, right? So physical needs, they are, are um, kind of the food, clothing, shelter that you think about, but it's also touch. Um, and in, you know, romantic relationships, that's also sexual touch, right? Um, it's your surroundings. It's where you live. Um, you know, with the pandemic that happens, we saw a lot of people kind of, right, having a really difficult time because their physical space, uh, everyone was at home or they were isolated, you know, one way or the other. So I think we're still dealing with so much of that, you know, even after the pandemic. But um, so it's also your space around you. It's where you live. Um, you know, I came from Arizona and uh, Prescott, Arizona, a really small town. And when I came here, I told them if this job would have been any closer to L.A., I would not have been able to take it because that that just didn't fit a physical need of mine to be able to get outside on a pretty regular basis. So sometimes I think we, you know, people often ask, well, what's a want and what's versus a need? But I believe, you know, we want to create the most desirable circumstance, right, to for our highest good. Um, so it, it's your surrounding is it's um, all of those things. Um, so that's physical and and remembering that what works for one person is going to be really different for another. So we may think, well, our because I work with eating disorder too, like, oh, our, our loved one, they're not eating enough. But, you know, what we need and, uh, around food may not be what another person needs around food. 
or what one person needs around touch might not be what another person needs around touch. So there will need to be also some communicating with the people that we are closest to. So that's physical. Did you have any questions about that one, Timothy? Well, how, how do you assess those? Do you have uh, interview questions? Do you have scales or profiles that you use for assessing that? I really just work with the person individually and families because that can cause a lot of stress in families, right? Because there's, if you have five people in that family. So I actually do um, some pretty in-depth just talking to them about what's important to them and physically. And, you know, some people need to work out daily where other people want to be on the couch. Um, so it's mostly just really getting them, like using this chart and having them add to it often, um, revisiting, you know, with them. But for people that are listening, I would have a chart for yourself and just keep adding to it as you go throughout your day when you notice like, oh, especially like if somebody has chronic pain, which I do, um, you know, I have to get up and stand up. That's a physical need. Um so I would just have people continue to kind of add to it as they go. Okay. Emotional needs, as we kind of know, in a way, um, it's harder to, to decipher um, our emotional needs. And how I kind of go about this one with people is that quite often when it's when we're in lack of it is when we notice that we need it, especially with emotional needs. So if you are feeling disrespected or not loved or, you know, invalidated, those, it's almost like those are the times where you can start to define your emotional needs a little better. Some people don't know it's, you know, they need to have a sense of belonging. Um, you know, like the one here, I say respect for some people that's really high on the list for others, not so much. Um, so just really working to get more in touch with their emotional needs. It, it's a tricky one. And, you know, our, we're looking at mental health. It's coming out everywhere. So people are giving it more attention. And uh, once again, I go back to the pandemic. I think that gave us a chance to also kind of tap into what our emotional needs are. And remember, emotion, emotions and feelings are a little different. Our feelings are like, when we get angry or, you know, sad um, and using the emotions, you can also kind of start to talk about and define what your emotional needs are. If you're having a, an emotion flare, a feeling, a lot of times it's directly related to the emotional need. So that one can be trickier for people. And that's another place and we often give, and with families, this is a big piece. We often give others what we ourselves need rather than what they need. So if we need a lot of validation, then we tend to give a lot of validation. And that might feel like overload to someone else. So when you're doing this with a family, you would help them map out and then it's almost, you know, it's it's akin to the five love languages that you let yes. people know very specifically what they might do that would help a, another family member feel that their emotional needs are getting met, even if that's not exactly what you would want to be given to you to meet your emotional needs. Absolutely. And it happens more often than it happens with couples. It happens in friendships. And, you know, that's that trickier part, too, of, you know, the wounded, the wounded need sometimes, right, that in the emotional realm, that's where we tend to fall more into that wounded part. And I also help them kind of tease that apart. You know, like if you're like, if someone's saying, I just need to be, you know, respected, and if I'm not respected, and they get very activated, I can kind of tell it's like, oh, that's probably more from a wounded part. 
Um, so we work with that. It doesn't mean that, right, this isn't like, you know, other addictions like drugs and that we don't need those things, but we need, emo we have, we need emotion. We, we have emotional needs. So we have to be able to kind of learn to have a relationship with our, with our emotional needs um, rather than, you know, it's a little different because some of those are very like to be loved and respected and validated are some just sort of basic human needs. But if they're coming from the wound, they'll just, they'll be insatiable. And that person just is driven to get that need met um, all, all the time, almost. All right. And the, the last category you have here is the personal needs of spiritual life, nature and art. And as you mentioned, often these are neglected because they're not, you know, the the, the bleeding artery. You know, it's not the screaming intense issue. Absolutely. And it's, you know, it can leave us in that space of failure to thrive. A lot, I think, if we don't add that that those personal needs in. So personal needs are there's sort of anything else that kind of set us on fire for this life, that make us feel whole, make us feel peaceful. They could be things that are exciting to us. Um, I call a lot of that you know, my spiritual time. And that's, you know, that's not to offend anyone with any sort of religious anything. To me, it's just those moments that are so different than the physical and the emotional. Now, right, some of these can kind of blend into the other need areas, like one may meet several of the need areas. But personal needs are, you know, those things that just give us, um, like energy to 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 feel and to move into our life and not be kind of in that sort of flat space with our life. So it's nature, it's getting outside. It may be spirit. I, you know, I call myself kind of a spiritual geek. I love to just study any spiritual text, um, art, music, dance, um, movements. You and know, any, one of the things any, that that I direct people to in this area is anything that when you're doing it, you lose track of time. Oh, I like that. Yes. That's perfect. Right. It does. It, right. It does. It kind of transcends time. Um, so if, if that's being sort of left out, think about that. I mean, we tend to, we do tend to focus on our physical needs. I think we're in more reaction to our emotional needs and then, like we were saying, the personal needs, it's like, oh, I'll get to them someday. Um, but what I've learned just over my years of doing this work is that we really do need these all going on on a pretty regular basis to keep us in that beautiful upright fingerprint of who we are so that we can do what we came here to do. Um, that's really how I kind of look at it, the work. And um, so how do you help people either individually or in the family session or format to step into getting all of these areas balanced and met? It's similar. Or, uh, I and, mean, I and, use... and or how do you help them? resolve some of the trauma energy and move it out of the way so this natural flow of meeting these needs can arise. Right. So individually with the releasing of the trauma, um, those pieces, um, it really, I, I do uh, incorporate energy work. Um, and it's a lot of doing this definition. It, I do, I use, I utilize Reiki, um, but like my center, you know, there's other forms of energy work that are more, um, I guess, evidence-based. Reiki's coming up the ladder a little, but it's not quite there yet. But, um, you know, that's where some EMDR work can help any sort of movement, things where we're activating right and left brain, um, moving through those traumas. You know, those can all be helpful, but I do utilize, uh, you know, Reiki work. 
Um, and a lot of times too, it's letting them share and really getting underneath to what those wounded parts um, are, what those wounded parts are doing on a daily basis. And then we, you know, together let them kind of sit in that wounded part. And it is talking to the part, um, working with, it's, it's a little different than like inner child work um, and really not acknowledging that part for what it brought to the table. Some of that's like the Rich, Richard Swartz exactly. uh, internal yes. family systems. So um, addressing that part, um, seeing it's it's what it brought to the person, um, and then trying to kind of incorporate that more. So those are the um, the interventions, and I do that with the family work too, um, similar, and really exposing that everyone in the family has needs is almost mind blowing when they kind of start to acknowledge that. And um, how do we work together as a family to get everybody's needs met? Um, working to get them out of the reactivity through that definition. So, I mean, it takes some time, but it 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 really works. And um, I mean, I get letters even to this day, you know, with people just thanking me, and um, which you know, I mean, not not from my ego. I just want to help. And um, it's just such a beautiful uh, thing to hear from them. So. Well, and it seems like if you can help multiple family members get clear about these three different categories of needs and specifically about what would help them satisfy them, leave them feeling gratified or purposeful in their life. And the other family members can become aware of that. And as you said, start to work as a team to help everyone have their needs met. That's rather transformative. It so is. And, you know, if, if you think about it, if our if our needs are being met and we are more upright, that's the proactive part. And all that reactivity, it just starts to kind of settle. You know, that's really the beauty of it. It, you know, it doesn't mean that things don't flare here and there. Conflict doesn't arise. But if we're in that upright position, it, it's how I talk about when my daughter was little. If I was getting enough sleep and I had, you know, eaten and had spent some time with my friends, been out with my horse, I'm I'm pretty good with her. I mean, she's old, older now. She's 25. But at the time, if I didn't have those things, I was in a lot of reactivity and I was in my old snapshots. So that's where it is more proactive than reactive. Yeah, exactly. Well, are there other modalities that you blend in with the work you do? Other than um, Reiki and some EMDR? Uh, I don't do EMDR myself, but my center, they do that. Um, I, I, mindfulness is always, um, and, you know, I always speak to them about those sort of things. But this is my core piece of work that I sort of bring to the table um, at the different centers that I've been at. I would love to go back into doing family workshop. Um, that hasn't happened um, in a couple of years, but... Um, yeah, those are the main the main pieces that I bring. And when you say family workshop, is that um, like family constellations work? Right, that would be the sculpting. Yeah. Well, if you just take a breath and get settled here and think, all right, so we've talked for a while about what you do and, and how you work with people. Is there something that you want to go back and highlight or something that we haven't even asked you about yet about your work that and what drives your passion for it that you want to bring out for us before we wrap up? Well, you know, I, um, I just finished uh, my spiritual memoir and that's going to be coming out. Um, and I guess, you know, it, that is where this, drive comes from. The book's called Surviving Irene. Uh, it's about overcoming my spiritually abusive grandmother. 
Um, so from that, and the kind of subtitle for it is releasing the need for the wounded child. Um, and that's really where I came to a lot of this work that I'm doing with people. It's I know personally that we don't have to remain in those snapshots. And um, a lot of this really kind of was birthed through my own process of kind of walking out of the snapshot and still remaining um, around my grandmother and my family. So I know that it's possible. And uh, I guess I just want to share that. And the book also speaks, you know, I've had some experiences with, I've lost a lot of people in my life and have had some experiences with them. I mean, that's kind of a different topic, but you know, those are in the book. So I just, I have a really strong and what I call a spiritual life, but it's really very different, I think, than what a traditional spiritual life uh, looked like a long time ago for me. So yeah, just super passionate about uh, helping people get, you know, back to their, their fingerprints, which I call back home to self. So yeah. All right. So the the book again is Surviving Irene. Mm -hmm. And how how long before that's available? I think it'll be just a few months. Um, I'm in process with a it's kind of a hybrid publisher. So um, hopefully it'll be soon. And um, it's also going to have a workbook and accompanying working journal that has a lot of these things that we just talked about in it. Wonderful. So if people wanted to reach out to you, what's the best way for them to connect? Um, my website, which is writer, R-Y-D-E-R method.com. And um, my uh, email is on there and my phone number. Excellent. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for sharing the, this story and your method with us. And um, I look forward to uh, getting a copy of your memoir when it comes out. Absolutely. It was my pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. Dale Ryder is a social worker who currently provides services at the New Beginnings Center, serving those people with chronic pain, addiction, mental health challenges, and trauma. Her specialties include family program and workshops, spirituality, equine program, and experiential workshops. She also provides Reiki sessions that include journey work, assisting in a holistic approach to trauma release. She is passionate about the work she does and living in a supportive environment that feeds her spiritual, emotional, and personal needs. The recovery field has given her an incredible opportunity to assist others and gain insight into her own personal growth while assisting families in generational healing. She works to assist others in reclaiming their authentic self through connecting with spiritual practices and accepting the vision of this path to wholeness. She is currently in the process of publishing her spiritual journey as a memoir titled Surviving Irene. This will contain or have a companion journal to support the work of others on a bigger scale. You've been listening to the On Your Mind podcast offered by Journey's Dream, where we support people through mental health challenges to a place of true and lasting well-being. If you love our show, we invite you to visit onyourmindpodcast.org to join the conversation, access the show notes, and discover our helpful resources. Thank you for listening.